Good morning. Will everyone please rise for the platform party at Dainty Room? Thank you, you may be seated. Uh, good morning again, and thank you all for coming to University of Louisville McConnell Center's Distinguished Speaker Series this morning. My name is Tanner Morrow, and I have the honor of serving as the chairperson for the program this year. This morning, we are thrilled to be welcoming our 62nd Distinguished Speaker, Senator Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. Before we proceed, I would like to ask everyone to please silence your cell phones at this time. Thank you. I now have the distinct privilege of introducing the interim president of the University of Louisville, Dr. Lori Stewart Gonzalez. President Gonzalez began her tenure at the University of Louisville as the executive vice president and university provost in April of 2021. Following the departure of former UofL president Neely Vindapudi in December 2021, Dr. Gonzalez was immediately appointed as acting president. Under her leadership, the University of Louisville has just welcomed its largest incoming freshman class ever opened two brand new steady art residence halls on campus and broken ground on a $144 million expansion of the University of Louisville Hospital, just to name a few of her accomplishments so far. Please join me in welcoming the phenomenal President Lori Stewart Gonzalez. Thank you, thank you. Um, I got credit for a lot of good things happening on this campus. It's a great team we have here. I want to welcome everyone to UofL, give you a warm cardinal welcome for this very special event. I want us to especially welcome Secretary Chow, who gave you a shout out before we ever sat down. So <laughs> you grace us with your presence every time and we're so glad that you're here. It's a great honor for U of L to host these types of events and the McConnell Center and the leader is responsible for bringing so many distinguished guests here for us to hear about what's going on in our world. Um, it's a wonderful program made possible by our very own alumnus, Senator Mitch McConnell. You know, he has deep roots in this university and this community. He came to U of L as a student in the 1960s with a major in political science in the College of Arts and Sciences, and he also served as student government president of the college. As an alumnus, he's made many contributions to his alma mater, including the establishment of the McConnell Center, and we have many students here who could testify to the power of the learning that happens there. But he also was there for the expansion of our library and so many other initiatives that we don't have time to, to list them all but he's helped shape UofL into the wonderful school that it is today. So the McConnell Center offers important educational programs to our community. Our scholars get hundreds of hours in um, global issues to become engaged citizens and global scholars. So we're grateful to Senator McConnell for his support of this incredible scholarship program and I hope you have a chance to meet some of our scholars. We also salute him for his long and distinguished career as a public servant, the impact he's had on our city, his home state, our university, and frankly, the world. He was first elected to the Senate in 1984. He's the longest serving Republican leader in the history of the United States and only the second Kentuckian to serve as a majority leader in the U.S. Senate. He has roles, has been a senior member on appropriations, agriculture and rules, before serving in the Senate, he worked here in Louisville as judge executive for Jefferson County. His dedication to our university, our community, our state, and our country is impressive and unquestionable. I'm so glad to be able to introduce him. We're so glad you're a Cardinal, and we welcome you back home to U of L once again. <laughs>
Well, thank, thank you very much, Laurie. I kind of hated for you to stop. <laughs> Let me start by giving a shout out to Laurie, who's done a spectacular job uh, filling in as acting president here over the last uh, half year or so. And um, we're thrilled with the good work that you've done and the leadership you've provided. I also want to thank Sherry Allen and the McConnell Center staff for organizing today's event. Uh, Gary Gregg, our director, is not here today, but the reason he isn't, we also have a program with the U.S. Army where these um, both non-commissioned and commissioners, uh, commissioned officers come in for a month and do a deep dive. It's called the Strategic Broadening Program. You do a deep dive into everything from uh, philosophy to politics, things they're not routinely uh, uh, doing in the, in the Army. Anyway, they're in Washington this, this, this week, and that's why Gary is not here. This program is uh, now a little over 30 years old. We've got over 250 graduates who are doing important things, not only in Kentucky, but around the country. And part of the goal was if they could have a top quality education here, they'd be more likely to come back to Kentucky and, and live and work here. And we believe over 60% of the graduates did come back to Kentucky, no matter what they did after they left the program. And a number of them are in the audience here today. They're occupying all kinds of important positions. Uh, two of them happen to be elected officials statewide right now. Um, this is, I told Kirsten, it's not a prep school for politicians, so everybody's going into lots of different fields, everything from business to medicine, you name it. Um, what I've tried to do over the years is make sure these students and the community has a chance to hear from distinguished uh, leaders. Uh, George Schultz kicked this program off uh, a long time ago and lived to be 100 years old. I wonder if there was some connection. <laughs> Um, recently, we had Justice Amy Coney Barrett last, uh, last year about this time. Our, our colleague uh, Amy Klobuchar was here in the, in the spring. Uh, Vice President Biden came here while he was Vice President, Secretary Clinton while she was Secretary of State. So we've had a pretty bipartisan approach here over the years, including uh, the Chief Justice, of course, a number of years ago. Today, I have the privilege of introducing the senior senator from Arizona. I've only known Kirsten for uh, four years, but she is, in my view, and I've told her this before, the most effective first-term senator I've seen in my time in the Senate. She is today what we have too few of in the Democratic Party, a genuine moderate and a deal maker. She's always looking, you know, some of you have heard me say, I always feel like if you're looking at a football field and you've got divided government or a lot of big differences on big issues, look for the things within the 40 yard line that you can agree on and try to do those. Well, we've done some of that, even though this is an all democratic government right now, we've done some of that and Kirsten has been right in the middle of, if not the principal leader of, getting us to an outcome in a highly partisan time on infrastructure, on school safety, mental health, postal reform, the CHIPS bill, you name it. Every single thing that we've been able to work together on. Now we've got some very big differences, as you know, but every single thing that we've had an opportunity to work together on She's been a leader of and involved in and is extraordinarily effective. As you can tell, I have a very high opinion of the Senator from Arizona, but the, my biggest compliment to her is she protects the institution of the Senate. Some of you may recall the former president would harangue me on virtually a weekly basis about trying to 
lowered the threshold in the Senate from 60 to, to, to 51. In other words, to turn the Senate into the House. If we did that, we'd have fancier, off, or fancier desk, but we'd be a lot like the House. And how that would damage the country is things would go back and forth and back and forth and lack of stability. That's not what the Founding Fathers had in mind when they created the United States Senate. They created it to stop bad stuff and to allow things that we could agree on to go forward. That was not fashionable in the Democratic Party in the last year and a half. It took one hell of a lot of guts for Kirsten Sinema to stand up and say, I'm not going to break the institution in order to achieve short-term goals. And in the end, only two, just two, of the 50 Democratic senators were willing to protect the institution itself against uh, sort of the mob, which in many ways dominates uh, the Democratic Party these days, in my view. So I can't tell you how important she's been uh, to the Senate as an institution as well, because if you break the institution, you fundamentally change the country. And I can tell you the institution might well have been broken, but for our guest today, it's my honor and pleasure to present Senator Kirsten Sinema. Uh, thank you so much, Senator McConnell, and thank you all so much for being here. Tanner, thank you for opening today, and President Gonzalez, thank you so much for hosting um, me and, and allowing me to join you all today. It is such an honor to join the ranks of the very distinguished guests who've been welcomed by the McConnell Center and the McConnell Scholars. Uh, you know, at first glance, Senator McConnell and I have relatively little, or some could even say nothing, in common. <laughs> for starters, he drinks bourbon. I drink wine. He's from the Southeast, and I'm from the Great Southwest. He wears suits and ties, and I uh, wear dresses and these fierce sneakers. <laughs> and perhaps most obviously, we come from opposing political parties. But despite our apparent differences, Senator McConnell and I have forged a friendship, one that is rooted in our commonalities, including our pragmatic approach to legislating, our respect for the Senate as an institution, our love for our home states, and a dogged determination on behalf of our constituents. You know, in today's partisan Washington, it might shock some that a Democratic senator would consider the Republican leader of the Senate her friend, but back home in Arizona, we don't view life through a partisan lens. Arizonans understand that while we may not agree on every issue, we do share the same values. We value grit, perseverance, and cooperation. You know, Arizonans expect their political leaders to work together regardless of party politics, to make progress, and then move out of the way so that everyday people can build better lives for themselves and for their families. And over the past few years, I've worked with elected leaders from all political stripes to deliver real results for communities across my state. Through successful collaborations on issues ranging from community violence to infrastructure investments, I've seen firsthand that Arizonans, Kentuckians, and Americans from communities across our country are far more united than today's politics would lead us to believe. From my experience, everyday Americans don't immediately retreat to their partisan corners in their day-to-day -day lives. In fact, most of us believe that those partisan labels needlessly divide us. Most Americans understand that we're all working towards the same goal, to create progress, build more positive communities, work hard, and achieve the American dreams. So why in recent years does it seem like partisanship has gotten worse and worse? In Washington, our politics have become increasingly radicalized, spiraling steadily downward into bitter and tribal extremism. Cable news pundits, outside groups, and some political leaders on both sides of the aisle 
have let the loudest and most extreme voices in each party dominate the discourse and set the agenda because it stokes anger and it gets tweets, views, clicks. But it doesn't solve problems. More and more, it seems like Americans are being told that in order to be a member of either political party, you must adhere to a strict set list of policy viewpoints. But I don't think that's how a majority of Arizonans or Kentuckians or everyday Americans think. You know, we use our own judgment, our own lived experiences to form our honestly held beliefs. And we just don't have the time or the energy to think about politics every waking moment. I certainly don't. And that's why I ran for the Senate, because I promised Arizonans something different. I promised I'd be an independent voice for our whole state, not just those who shared my party identification, and that I would work with anyone to deliver lasting results. You know, that approach has proved successful, helping us pass our historic infrastructure investment and jobs act into law, making America stronger and safer, creating good paying jobs, and expanding economic opportunities across the country. You know, for decades, American infrastructure has been crumbling. And despite the fact that it was infrastructure week, week after week, progress was continuously blocked by partisanship. But our law makes a once in a generation investment in America's economy, including over $100 billion to repair and upgrade our highways, our roadways, our bridges, and other major transportation projects. Our law is providing faster internet for people in more places by investing over $65 billion to deploy high-speed broadband and help families afford internet service. It's resulting in cleaner, more reliable water sources by making the strongest investment in drinking water and wastewater infrastructure in US history. And our law results in the largest investment in clean energy transmission and electric vehicle infrastructure in US history, electrifying thousands of buses, increasing our critical mineral supply chains, and building out a national network of electric vehicle charging stations. And my favorite part, we achieved all of these goals without raising taxes on everyday Americans. But beyond our laws, transformative economic investments, our law also provided a roadmap to make Washington work better. Rather than defeating um, and feeding that those divisions with extreme rhetoric or those all or nothing purity tests, personal attacks, the 10 senators who worked together to negotiate this infrastructure and jobs law, we showed America something different. So our approach to writing this law was grounded in the issues that matter most to everyday Americans and a sincere desire to bridge our differences and forge common ground around our shared values. In a demonstration of how the Senate is designed to work, the senators in our group effectively represented the needs of the regions we represent. Senator Cassidy in the Deep South and Gulf Coast, Senator Warner in the Mid-Atlantic, Senator Manchin in Appalachia, Senators Romney and Tester in the West, Senator Portman representing the Midwest. The Northeast and Alaska, each with very unique infrastructure needs, were ably represented by Senators Shaheen, Collins, and Murkowski, also known as the group's Wonder Women. <laughs> Together, the 10 of us shut out noise from the extremes, refused to demonize each other when we had disagreements, and instead we focused on identifying creative solutions and common sense compromises to get the job done. You know, these values of collaboration and focus also guided my work in passing into law our bipartisan Safer Communities Act, historic legislation that will save lives, help children learn and grow in healthy and supportive environments, and make our communities safer, more vibrant places. You know, for too long, political games in Washington on both sides of the aisle, stopped progress from protecting our communities and keeping families safe and secure. So common sense proposals were tossed to the side by partisan lawmakers who chose politics instead of solutions. You know, elected officials make a habit of insulting one another 
for offering thoughts and prayers, for blaming violence only on mental illness or video games or particular kinds of weapons or any cause that didn't align with and confirm their own preconceived beliefs. But casting blame and trading political barbs and attacks became the path of least resistance. Meanwhile, communities across our country who experienced senseless violence, like in Uvalde, Texas, deserved better than Washington politics as usual. Our communities deserved a commitment from their leaders to do the necessary but very hard work of putting aside the politics, identifying problems that needed to be solved, and working together towards common ground and common goals. That's why, after the horrific tragedy at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas, Senators Chris Murphy, John Cornyn, Tom Tillis, and myself, all representing diverse states from across the country, we got to work debating a range of solutions that would save lives, make our community safer, and protect Americans' constitutional rights. As we wrote our bill, we viewed our conversations as collaborations, not negotiations. And we refused to frame our work as giving up something to get something in return, but stayed laser focused on our shared goal of reducing violence across American communities. We acknowledged that the root of violence plaguing our communities is complex. It can be partly attributed to criminals with dangerous weapons and attributed to a mental health crisis affecting young people in cities and towns all across America. So we spent hours considering the policy provisions, ensuring we got the language just right, and that every policy included in our bill could help save lives and help children learn and grow in healthy and safe environments and make our communities safer, more vibrant places. It was hard work, but it was worth it. And there have been other bipartisan successes in this Congress, from long-awaited and necessary postal reform, I know that's very popular, <laughs> <laughs> to support for Ukraine in its fight against Vladimir Putin and his cronies in Russia, and most recently, the passage into law of our bipartisan Chips and Science Act, legislation that boosts America's global leadership, spurring job creation, and addressing our supply chain challenges by investing in manufacturing in America of semiconductors. Semiconductors, those small computer chips that grow in all, go in all of our electronic devices. They power our daily lives, and without them, our phones wouldn't work, our computers wouldn't turn on, our cars wouldn't run. And we're experiencing a global shortage in these chips. And if America lacks a reliable supply for these important components, we become more vulnerable to foreign actors, and we're forced to increase our reliance on other countries like China. So increasing the semiconductor production here at home boosts our national security. It reduces prices, shortens those shipping delays, and creates thousands of new high-paying jobs across our country. But unfortunately, earlier this summer, Washington politics got in the way of meaningful bipartisan progress on this bill, and it threatened Congress's ability to pass a robust piece of legislation tackling our economic challenges now and shaping our economy into the future. And I knew we couldn't let that happen. So Senator Todd Young, my friend from Indiana, and with the backing of both the Democratic and Republican Commerce Committee leaders in the Senate, we convened a group of 20 senators from both sides of the aisle to discuss the bill's proposals and to plan a path forward. You know, by getting our colleagues in a room and discussing the legislation face to face, we all agreed that we shouldn't sacrifice this smart legislation to the partisan games that were happening with the U.S. House of Representatives. So Senator Young and I began whipping votes to see how much support we could get. And our legislation passed the Senate with 64 votes, and it's now law. But beyond the historic investments in American semiconductor manufacturing, the bipartisan science portions of our law, which were at risk of falling out of the bill entirely, they invest in the kind of basic research that spur our economy, that raise our global competitiveness, that create jobs, 
and allow Americans to live better lives and have brighter futures. Now these bipartisan successes represent the lasting results that can and should happen when elected leaders take the steps of healing our country's divisions by setting aside differences, shutting out the noise and the distractions, and focus on moving forward and making progress. It's the easiest thing in the world for politicians to stay in their partisan corners, to line up on their respective sides of every battle. But what's harder is getting out of our comfort zones and forming coalitions with unlikely allies that can achieve lasting and durable results. But look, the difficult work of collaboration, that's what my constituents in Arizona expect. And I still believe with some pretty decent proof that it's the best way to identify realistic solutions instead of escalating this all or nothing political battle that results in no action or in those radical federal policy reversals. You know, over the last year, much has been discussed about the Senate's 60 vote threshold. And there's been a lot of talk about my continued support of it. American politics are cyclical and the granting of power in Washington, D.C. is exchanged regularly by the voters from one party to another. The shift of power back and forth means that the SIN 60 vote threshold has, provide, has proved maddening to members of both political parties, as we have seen in recent years. Viewed either as a weapon of obstruction or a safety net to save the country from radical policies, depending on whether you serve in the majority or the minority at the moment. But what is the legislative filibuster other than a tool that requires that new federal policy to be broadly supported by senators representing a broader cross-section of Americans, a guardrail, ensuring that the millions of Americans not represented by the majority party in the moment have a voice in the process. Demands to eliminate this threshold by both political parties amount to a group of people separated on two sides of a canyon, shouting to their colleagues that the solution to their shared challenges is to make that rift both wider and deeper. Consider this. In recent years, nearly every party line response and partisan reaction to the problems we face have led us to more divisions, not less. The impact is clear for all to see. The steady escalation of tit for tat, the weakening of our guardrails, and the exclusion of input from the other party furthers the resentment and anger amongst elected leaders and our constituents at home. The truth is, the majority of Arizonans and Kentuckians and Americans, they don't belong to either polarizing end of the ideological spectrum, but rather like me, they fit in somewhere in the middle. And these escalating tit for tats, these political fights are largely why increasingly high numbers of Americans are rejecting both political parties. In fact, Arizona voters not affiliated with either political party represent both the biggest share of voters in Arizona and the fastest growing group of the Arizona electorate. Now that may shock political pundits and partisans in Washington, but by working with Arizonans and communities across my state, it shows me that good ideas and practical solutions don't belong to one party or to one ideology. Right now, our country faces real challenges and Americans have been asked to do more with ever less. The prices of everyday goods continue to increase. Supply chains remain uncertain. In Arizona, our water supply is in jeopardy and businesses continue to face an unpredictable climate with a dwindling workforce and an unsteady economic growth. So continuing to indulge our increasingly toxic politics won't help us come together to solve the problems that plague our country. But we can reject extreme partisanship. We can ignore 
the noise on cable news. We can reject the zero-sum political games and instead choose to focus on what unites us. We can choose to work together to make progress on the issues that matter most to the Americans that we have a duty to serve. Imagine what more we could accomplish if more folks joined me in this approach, if rather than staying in their comfortable partisan corners, more leaders reached out in a genuine desire to find good faith compromises and craft durable solutions to our country's most difficult challenges. But unfortunately, there's intense pressure on members of Congress these days to spend time and energy on every scandal, every insult, every tweet, every partisan fight, and it is very easy to get distracted. But working across the aisle and building friendships with those who have differing political views, look, that doesn't fit in in today's Washington. And if you don't fit in in today's Washington, trust me, they want to kick you out. <laughs> but I've never really wanted to fit in, not in Washington and not anywhere else. And I was not elected to play politics. I was elected to achieve lasting results and to solve the problems that matter most to the Arizonans that I'm honored to serve. And that, that is how we renew Arizonans and Americans' confidence that our government is worthy of us and working for us. So I'll tell you what I tell everyone I have an opportunity to speak with. My pledge is to keep doing just what I've been doing. I'll work with Leader McConnell. I'll work with Leader Schumer. I'll work with Republicans, I'll work with Democrats, I'll work with everyone in between, and anyone who's willing to roll up their sleeves and do the hard work to maximize opportunities and to deliver lasting results for our country. So thank you. Thank you for having me here today. And thank you for your commitment to democracy in our country. I appreciate it. hear me? We good? Okay. So hi, Senator Sinema. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. My name is Madeline and I'm a staff member with the McConnell Center and I'll now take us into the Q&A portion. First, you touched on this in your talk, but can you expound on why you hold such support for the filibuster, especially when many others in your party have opposing views? That's such a great question, Madeline. You know, Senator McConnell mentioned this in his opening remarks and I mentioned it in, in my remarks as well. The danger of eliminating the 60 vote threshold is that the Senate becomes the House. And I remind everyone, I, I left the House and ran for the Senate for a reason. <laughs> I remember my early years, I, I served for uh, six years in the House of Representatives. And I remember being so frustrated during those six years because it felt like every time there was a big bipartisan solution that needed to happen, the Senate just kind of came up with a solution and then gave it to the House and we just ate it. And um, that's why I ran for the Senate. <laughs> yeah, I thought, wait a second, they're doing the work. The reality is, is that if you were to eliminate the 60 vote threshold in the Senate, the Senate would become like the House, smaller, older, but basically like the House. And the, the trouble with that is that, you know, the House with elections every two years, representing a smaller group of uh, voters by each House, um, they really represent the passions of the moment in the, political, in the political spectrum. So as you all know, Control changes between the House and the Senate every couple of years. It's likely to change again in just a few weeks, right? Um, and so when the House passes legislation, it represents that kind of rapidly shifting, was that, everything's fine, right? Great. <laughs> Not everyone likes me, so just check in, you know? Um, so so the, the House passes legislation that represents the passions of the moment. And that's what it was designed to do when our forefathers created the House. They wanted a body that represented the passions of Americans at the moment. But they tend to be a little bit over eager. So when Republicans are in control, they pass a little bit of crazy legislation. And when the Re Democrats are in control, they pass a little bit of crazy legislation. And the job of the Senate is to cool that passion. You know, there's a saying that um, the House is the cup of hot tea and the Senate is the saucer in which you cool that tea. 
The Senate was designed to be a place that moves slowly, to cool down those passions, to think more strategically and long-term about the legislation before us. And most importantly, it was designed to require comity, to require people to compromise and work together so that the legislation we pass represents the viewpoints of a broad spectrum of the country, not just the passion of the moment. And so while it is frustrating as a member of the minority in the United States Senate, and equally frustrating as a member of the majority, right? Because you must have 60 votes to move forward. That frustration represents solely the short-term angst of not getting what you want. And those of you who are parents in the room know that the best thing you can do for your child is to not give them everything they want, right? And that's important in the United States Senate as well. We shouldn't get everything we want in the moment because later, upon cooler reflection, you recognize that it has probably gone too far. So the importance of the 60 vote threshold is to ensure that no one gets everything they want, that you compromise, that you find that middle ground. And by doing so, you're much more likely to pass legislation that stands the test of time, that will not be reversed when the next party gains power. That's the importance of the 60 vote threshold. It's become politicized intensely in recent years. Our last president wanted to eliminate it every couple of days. Our current president talks about it on Twitter all the time. They're both wrong. They're both wrong. Because if we were to give in to that moment of wanting just what you want, the reversal that would come in a year or two years would not only be bad for the American body, it'd be bad for businesses, it'd be bad for state and local governments, and it'd be bad for us as Americans to think that we should always feed our short-term desires rather than thinking about the long-term. So not only am I committed to the 60 vote threshold, I have an incredibly unpopular view. I actually think we should restore the 60 vote threshold for the areas in which it has been eliminated already. We should restore it. Yep. Not everyone likes that. Um, <laughs> because it would make it harder. It would make it harder for us to confirm judges and it would make it harder for us to confirm executive appointments in each administration. But I believe that if we did restore it, we would actually see more of that middle ground in all parts of our governance, which is what I believe our forefathers intended. Next question, being halfway through your first term in the U.S. Senate, what has been the biggest accomplishment of Congress and what would you like to see accomplished in the next few years before the end of your first term? Oh, gosh. Um, biggest accomplishment. Th that's a tough one because we got a whole lot done. So I'm actually really proud of the last couple years. We've been very, very productive. Um, you know, passing the infrastructure law was just a massive achievement. Uh, Rob Portman, who was my principal partner in this effort, he and I spent so much time in a small room in the basement last year, I swear. I thought we were going to get scurvy. We never saw the sun. Um, we worked on that piece of legislation for nine months. And it, it will make a transformative difference in our country for businesses, for families, for people, I hope, who won't even notice the changes, just know that their life is a little bit easier and a little bit more productive. So I'm really proud of that. But I, I'll say that perhaps the most emotionally meaningful legislation that I've worked on was when I partnered with my friend Senator John Cornyn of Texas. Um, you know, after his community was just tragically shaken by the horrific shooting in Uvalde. My, my heart went out to John. You know, in my first career, um, I was a social worker at an elementary school in an inner city school in Phoenix, Arizona. And so I witnessed violence in school um, during my early years, and I know how devastating it is for a community. And so my, my heart just went out so deeply to John. Um, when that tragedy occurred. And actually, the day of the shooting, <clears throat> I remember walking onto the floor of the United States Senate. Uh, I came out of the elevator, and a bunch of reporters, they always, the reporters always gather right outside the elevators, and I usually just walk right by them, because um, I don't have a lot of state of reporters. But I was just so emotionally touched um, and, and just in pain for those families that I said to these reporters, you know, I'm gonna 
I'm going to see who wants to work on this to see if we can't do something about the mental health crisis um, in our country and to see what we can't do to keep weapons out of the hands of those who are dangerously mentally ill. And as I said that, I, um, I thought, gosh, I just said that to reporters. Now I, now I have to do that. So I walked right onto the floor, and I walked right up to Mitch. And I said, Mitch, who should I talk to? And he said, Tom Tillis and John Cornyn. I said, OK. And I literally turned to Tom Tillis, and I said, well, you and I are going to work on this now. And I texted John, who was actually in Uvalde at the moment. And I said, when are you coming back? And he said, I'll be back tomorrow. And I said, can we meet? Can we meet in my office tomorrow? What time does your plane land? He said, it lands at 10. I said, great, we're meeting at 11. And at 11 o'clock the next day, John, Tom, Chris Murphy, who of course is the senator for Connecticut, home of the Sandy Hook massacre, the four of us sat down in, in my little office in the, in the basement of the Capitol. And 28 days later, we passed historic legislation that I believe will save thousands, thousands of lives in the future of our country. And I couldn't be more grateful for that opportunity to do that work because I think it's incredibly meaningful. It's given peace of mind to families when they're sending their little kids to school every day. And that for young people across this country who are facing unprecedented challenges and not able to get access to mental health, that they'll be able to get that access. And I do believe we'll be able to save lives. And we did it all while protecting the Second Amendment rights of all Americans, of which I care very deeply about, take very seriously, and am inordinately proud of. So that was really good work. It was great work to have done. Next, what inspired you to go into the field of social work, and what later inspired you to become a senator? Hmm. So um, when I was in first grade, uh, you know, the teacher goes around the room and asks you what you want to be when you grow up, and everyone was like, oh, I'm going to be a football player, and I'm going to be a ballerina. And I, nerd from birth, said, I'd like to be a United States senator and an author. And so it turns out I peaked kind of early. Um, so <laughs> uh, I was always interested in, in helping my community and giving back. Um, and the reason I became a social worker is actually quite personal. When I was in elementary school, at, actually about the time, that I told my first grade teacher I wanted to be a United States Senator and an author, um, my parents got divorced. Um, it was the early 1980s. We were entering at the time what we thought was a very bad recession. My dad had lost his job. Um, like many families facing financial stress, my parents got divorced. And um, after my parents' divorce, my mom really struggled. Uh, you know, she was um, a, a young woman with three kids. Um, she had a high school diploma, but had never had the opportunity to uh, get any higher education. And so she really struggled financially. Um, and so my family went from being kind of a normal middle class family to slipping into poverty. We were homeless for about three years of my childhood. And we lived uh, without running water and without electricity um, for much of my elementary school childhood. And a lot of people hear that and they think, gosh, that's just, that's outrageous, you know, to think about in America. But the reality is lots of lots of families live in that situation, right? Right now in Arizona, one in four kids have what's called food insecurity, which means they're not sure where their next meal is going to come from. That was me as a kid. And so as I got older, I realized that the people who helped throughout my childhood, friends, family, our church, that some of those people were social workers. And those are people who helped make sure that when I got to school that I got food and they made sure that we had clothing and that I was able to get access to the local library and later helped me fill out a Pell Grant application, go to college, got a scholarship. Um, I really got my shot at the American dream, right? And I stand here today, um, you know, I'm part-time professor at my university, Arizona State University. I've got all the degrees. Um, I'm a United States Senator. Like, I really got my shot at the American dream. But it wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been people looking out for me along the way. And some of those people were social workers. So when I first started my career, I started out as a social worker because I wanted to make sure that every kid, every kid across America, no matter where he or she came from, no matter what their circumstances were in their life, that if they worked hard, they could achieve the American dream, just like I did. And that was my, that was my decision. 
And really, social work and senator, kind of the same job. <laughs> it is. The key to being a good social worker is listening to people and understanding what they need. And then figuring out, how do I help someone? How do I solve their problem? How do I get them what they need? And the reality is, is that when you're working on legislation and building these big bipartisan coalitions on these really difficult and naughty problems, I believe you can always come to a solution. But the key is to listen. Listen to what someone else needs and then figure out how to get it for them. Because if you can get someone what they need, then they're willing to help you get what you need. And that's how you forge those compromises. That's how you solve those problems. Next, how has your experience working with students influenced your career in public service? Mm. So I've been teaching at Arizona State University, go Sun Devils, for 20 years. Um, this is, I'm actually teaching every semester. Um, I love it, teaching is wonderful. And some days it's a lot more rewarding than serving in the United States Senate. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite things about teaching is that moment when you see a student's eyes light up. When the student realizes or learns something brand new to them. It gives me chills, I've got chills right now thinking about it. That is my favorite moment in working with students. And so my goal in teaching is to help my students learn to think in a way that is different than they thought when they came into my classroom. At the end of a semester with me, I want my students to be able to have opened their brain to critical thinking, to look at the world through a lens different than the one that they already own to understand and respect that someone else's viewpoint, though maybe radically different than their own, is just as valid and meaningful as their own viewpoints. See, I believe that we all come to where we are through honest means. We are all a product of our own environment, our family, our faith, our education, our community. It shapes who we are. And who I am is different than who you are. But what I bring to the table is unique and important, and what you bring to the table is unique and important. And what I am concerned about that is missing from today's society in America is not just the tolerance, but the celebration of that difference. The recognition that what you bring, while it's different than what I bring, is something I can learn from, and that is important for me to understand and know. It broadens my viewpoint. It makes me a student of the universe, right? That's what the Greeks actually wanted when they created the idea of a university, is to learn about the universe, to have this broad education. So what I love about working with students is helping them see that broad universe, seeing things differently than they did before. That helps me in my work as a senator, because when I work with my colleagues of differing viewpoints, and I'll be honest, in the Senate, everyone has a different viewpoint than mine. And I'm grateful for that. Because if you ever meet someone who agrees with you 100%, either they're lying or you're lying, right? So the differing viewpoint is what's important. It's what makes our country valuable. It's what keeps us going, that diversity of thought and idea and background. That is what will carry us through our challenges. So in my work in the Senate, when someone has a differing viewpoint than mine, I don't see it as a threat. It doesn't bother me. I wanna learn from it and I wanna figure out how we can work together and bridge whatever divide we have to find that compromise in that middle ground. So my work with my students and my, my work with the colleagues is almost identical. The one difference is I can't correct the spelling of my colleagues. <laughs> I am tempted to do so. Uh, but I don't, I don't. That, it turns out that would tick them off. Awesome, okay, a more lighthearted question. What's more difficult, running for statewide office or running a marathon? So I'm an avid marathoner. Um, running a fast marathon is really difficult. I just ran one a couple weeks ago, and I tell you, I could barely walk in the Senate for the whole following week. I was just kind of walking around. But you know, in the Senate, that's fine. <laughs> Most of them struggle with walking anyway, so it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> The truth is, is that there's a lot of similarity between training for a hard marathon and running for statewide office. It requires a lot of discipline. You have to pay really close attention to nutrition and hydration, right? You don't want to get dehydrated, you want to run out of energy. But really, it's about the focus. It's about setting a goal. You know, my advice to young people um, 
is to set a goal that's a little bit harder than you can achieve, right? Set something that's too hard, an audacious goal, a little bit outside of your reach. And if you set a goal like that, and then you have the dedication and the focus to achieve that goal, that audacious goal that's a little bit beyond your reach, if you're focused and disciplined, and you're willing to listen to others to learn skills that you don't have, you can achieve that goal. And then when you do that, you gain confidence. That allows you to set the next slightly audacious goal, slightly too hard, slightly too big for you. And that's what I've been doing my entire life. You know, when I ran for the United States Senate, no woman had ever been elected to the Senate in the history of Arizona. I was also the first member of my party to be elected to the Senate in over 30 years. So when I first ran, people were like, there's no way she's gonna win. And I thought, ha ha, okay. Because <laughs> I knew I was gonna win the race because I knew I was setting a goal that was just slightly outside of my reach. But I also had a whole pattern of my life, right? Years of my life of setting goals that were slightly beyond my reach and then focusing in with dedication and with discipline and then being willing to do the work to reach that, to reach that goal. So they're the same, I would say. The only difference is that when you finally actually do run a marathon, you're done in under three and a half hours, right? If you run fast. But a, a Senate race, God, that thing goes on forever, forever. I envy the UK where their races go on for like six weeks and stuff like that. Now that's, that's a short training cycle. Ours are more like 18 months or two years. So it's a longer cycle, but the same principles, the same principles apply. And our last question, if you could get one bill or priority over the finish line and into law today, what would it be? You know, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, We've gotten so much done in the last two years, so I'm very proud of what we've done, but there is a challenge that I, that I still want to accomplish, and um, it's close to home for me. You know, I was born and raised near the border in southern Arizona, and for my entire lifetime, the federal government has absolutely failed, absolutely failed in its charter um, to protect our border. Uh, we have not had a secure border my entire life. And right now in our country, we have a shortage of workers. So we need to bring immigrants into this country to meet jobs from the very basic, like picking lettuce in Yuma, Arizona, where 90% of the lettuce of this country comes from. But we also need geniuses who are gonna do the physics and the engineering to help us be competitive in this global economy. And right now, we can't recruit the talent that we need in this country through legal means, because the immigration system is so broken. So I would love to be able to adjust our immigration system so that we're legally bringing in good people who want to be a part of this country to fill those jobs across our spectrum, and also to ensure that we actually have security on our border. Because right now, we do not. You probably have seen the news on television but right now in my state, over 2,000 people a day are coming illegally through the border in a tiny part of our state called Yuma, Arizona. Yuma is a small town. It's a farming town. We have one bus stop, no shelters. So you can imagine that 2,000 people coming across the border illegally every single day, we can't manage it. We have nowhere for them to go. And so we're facing both a legal crisis right, of people coming in the country, we can't tell who's good and who's bad, right? Some of those folks want to come and do good. Some of those folks want to do bad. But you can't tell the difference by looking. And so we don't have a legal system that allows us to bring in the talent of workers that we need while keeping out the bad guys who want to smuggle people and guns and drugs across our border. We also are facing a humanitarian crisis because we don't have the ability to care for all these people, including children who are coming across the border every day. So if I could, I would love, I would love to tackle this challenge. And I expect that after we get through this election, it's gonna be a hot six weeks or so ahead of us, but after we get through this election, I intend to reach back out to my good friend, Senator John Cornyn, also a child of the border, also born and raised in Texas, right? The two of us from different political parties but sharing the same core values, we recognize the crisis that we're in, and we want to solve it. 
Unfortunately, we've been stymied by political edges on both ends of the spectrum. One party that demands only border walls and security, and another party that wants amnesty for millions of people. The reality is, is that we have to address both our security needs and our workforce needs. And I hope to be able to partner with my friend John and deliver something in the next few months or couple years. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sinema. Senator, thank you so much for sharing the story of working together. I think we all know that we're stronger together and when we can come together, uh, we'll get much more done. I also want to thank you for sharing your personal story. Um, you would have been a student U of L would have recruited. At any given year, our freshman class has about 35% of our students as Pell eligible students. We want students that bring passion, that bring talent and dedication to change their lives and the lives of their families and their country. So you are an example of a perfect cardinal. So I'm going to give you this cardinal pin so that you understand that you really are. That's the good gift. She also said she drinks wine and not bourbon. But who can come to Kentucky and okay. not get a bottle of bourbon? I'm right? pretty excited about this. All right. <laughs> So this is our U of L bottle of Old Forester. Do not try to get it from her. She's got Secret Service around her. So there you go. Start with a mint julep as your first drink, and we know you're going to come back to us again. So thank you, thank so, you much. so much. It's our honor. Aww. Thank you. Thank you all again for coming. Uh, as the platform party departs, let's all rise again and thank them for coming. This will conclude our event, and thank you all again for coming today. It has been a great honor. Thank you.